Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Linux Foundation Public Health Webinar on uh, AI cybersecurity risks and challenges, opportunities and challenges in healthcare. Uh, we have a few people uh, wandered in. Give us 60 more seconds, and then we will kick off. Hope everyone is doing well on this Monday. Just as a reminder, there is a uh, Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. I'll be happy to be going through questions as we proceed here today. And with that, we will get started and uh, we will kick off today. And thank you for joining us. Slideshow mode here, there we go. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you for joining us for our LFPH March webinar, AI Cybersecurity and Healthcare, Understanding the Opportunities and Challenges. Uh, my name is Jim St. Clair. I'm the Executive Director for Linux Foundation Public Health, and I'm very happy to be joined today by my colleagues, Jim Dempsey and Pete Brucer, who will be presenting on uh, both the research done uh, in the areas of vulnerability and management uh, and AI, uh, as it relates to what we're discussing here in cybersecurity, uh, as well as work we're already doing in the Linux Foundation around open uh, source transparency, explainability, and, uh, and adversarial response and management in healthcare. A little bit about Linux Foundation Public Health. We're a little over two years old and one of the industry sector facing organizations in Linux Foundation, specifically around the use of open source software to help public health authorities and digital health around the world. Uh, we have uh, to date been very actively involved in open source tools for uh, um, COVID response, such as exposure notification and credentials. But as we continue to grow and to move into these other areas that are of interest to public health and digital health overall, can take advantage of open source innovation. First, let's spend just a minute talking about why AI and ML, artificial intelligence and machine learning in healthcare. Uh, it can serve as software that provides a second set of eyes uh, in, the, uh, in the ICU or the uh, uh, intensive care units. Uh, it can be used to tailor personalized treatments and personalized medication regimens. It helps reduce the administrative burden that all physicians go under, especially within the US. And what we just say as mining the data ocean. So one of the challenges, both in the uh, international digital health realm, as well as within the US, is recognizing that we are collecting tremendous amounts of digital data on all kinds of patients. In addition to clinical data, there are uh, numerous repositories with a tremendous amount of information about individuals that may pertain to areas that we call social determinants of health. This may be issues of uh, housing, economic security, other behavioral health concerns, and, and those data lakes and those data sources are available as well. And it's envisioned that AI and ML in many cases can assist with helping to automate, understand, visualize that information, again, to be able to support not only the administrative burden, but clinical decision-making for patients. So just to go through some of those clinical uses for artificial intelligence, as I was just referring to, concepts of predictive analysis, i.e. like COVID surges, uh, predominance of certain disease trends, um, being able to better understand medication efficacy, et cetera. Uh, it can support clinical decision support systems, uh, not in terms of both uh, treatment recommendations, uh, but instead of just point decisions, also can be learning constantly. It's what we call the health learning system, which is how can AI uh, and ML take advantage of all of that digital data that's available to uh, better personalize treatment, make localized or regionalized medical decisions. It can certainly assist in monitoring patients, both hospitalized and ambulatory, meaning uh, patients that are in the hospital and healthcare at home or healthcare outside the hospital facility. Uh, guiding uh, uh, surgical care uh, and the idea that AI can improve techniques or recommendations around uh, surgical procedures and surgical efficacy. And then finally, population health, which of course within LF uh, public health is a, a great area to, uh, to focus on. AI also has uses in clinical administration, be it US or internationally based, assist with transcription services, providing AI support to natural language processing, 
freeing up the physician and the clinician from having to manually type something in but capture those notes real time uh, through voice and AI. Uh, clinical operations such as uh, scheduling, transfers, admissions, discharges, and, uh, and movement to other facilities. Um, automation support in terms of automating processes that are normally done manually and may require a lot of uh, uh, manual intervention. Uh, what we call coding and billing in the U.S., which is a, a big function around uh, for different treatments and different clinical encounters, uh, how you apply a set of national and international codes such as ICD-10, so those, those clinical encounters are properly documented uh, and can be applied for, for insurance purposes. And then finally, trend analysis, understanding where the greater efficiencies could be made in administrative functions. However, of course, there are challenges in healthcare and, and a range of challenges that you have to be concerned about. First and foremost, I'm sure everyone recognizes that uh, AI in healthcare is a critical area, uh, meaning that you can't make mistakes in your AI calculations in healthcare that you can afford to make, say, in the financial industry. If you misidentify a patient, if you misapply data and, and make uh, improper recommendations, there could be severe adverse effects. Um, including, of course, patient death, that this information isn't done right. So one of the immediate concerns we have is the, you know, in mining that data ocean, what kind of pollution is there? How reliable is the data? What kind of sanitization has it gone through? Um, is there transparency in algorithms? Or are those algorithms proprietary? And in this case, that transparency is critical to understand if the AI algorithms, the AI and ML processes align to openly accepted clinical standards of care or leverage uh, open data standards such as HL7 for, for uh, using data and data transformation. Pa patient privacy, uh, one of the challenges we have in the US is that we have specific procedures for de-identifying patient data as we call it, which is a way to remove personal information associated with healthcare data. However, there's already been studies that show that there are methods, is, uh, methods and, and, and mechanisms using AI and ML that can re-identify those individuals and create privacy risks. How do we manage that? Liability issues, uh, specifically in the US but elsewhere, uh, if clinicians are using AI for decision-making, uh, how does the responsibility and liability for good clinical judgment fall onto that machine and their understanding of how that machine is doing it? And then lastly, but by no means least, is this overall concept of cybersecurity and AI, which is what we'll be touching upon today. In the US as a complement to ISO, we have the NIST cybersecurity framework from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Uh, it has been promoted through the US government, Department of Health and Human Services as a framework and best practices for healthcare organizations to adopt cybersecurity principles. And as you can see there, it covers five major pillars, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And specifically in the area of AI and ML, we're going to focus today on detection and the concepts of vulnerability management. With that, it's my distinct pleasure to be able to turn over to uh, Dr. Jim Dempsey uh, from the Stanford Cyber Policy Center to talk about their research with regards to cybersecurity and vulnerability management in AI. Uh, and I think it's an area that hasn't been as addressed as well. And I know that uh, uh, Jim has some recommendations for policy. So with Jim, of that, Jim, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, turn my screen over to you, sir. Jim, thanks so much and um, delighted to be here. Congratulations to the uh, Linux Foundation for putting this together. Um, one minor uh, correction, I'm not a doctor. Don't pretend to be, don't play one on, don't play one on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> we'll call I'm, you a doctor of AI security for today. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a lawyer um, and I look at this from a policy perspective, but like a lot of lawyers in the digital age, I try to understand the technology behind uh, these uh, services and features that we're uh, enjoying in our lives. And um, just to sort of uh, emphasize the point that, that Jim made, um, AI has huge potential, in fact, already is uh, displaying uh, huge uh, benefits to healthcare uh, generally as it is, uh, as AI is throughout every sector of our economy. This is uh, just uh, one example, uh, 2018, uh, Google AI uh, worked with the uh, Naval Medical Center in uh, San Diego, I think it was, to uh, develop a 
a program for analyzing uh, breast cancer uh, images, uh, breast images, in order to uh, identify uh, metastatic uh, small metastases. And the Google system uh, claimed at least a 99% a accuracy in uh, discovering these uh, particularly small, uh, otherwise hard to detect uh, metastases, where the human uh, reviewer would have a 62% uh, false negative rate. That is, they would miss the human operating under time constraints would uh, miss 62%. Uh, the Google AI system uh, caught 99% uh, percent of them. And um, AI is here already. Uh, this, this chart is, is a couple of uh, years old, but a huge number of products uh, out there. And if certainly if you're on the uh, healthcare administration side, I assume you're being hit every day by uh, offers from vendors uh, offering AI-based or AI-enhanced uh, services. And pretty much throughout any healthcare operation today, whether it's on the care delivery side or on the research side, uh, AI is already, already here and it's here to stay and the benefits are significant. That said, we do have to have a realization and an appreciation for the uh, limitations and the potential um, downsides of the potential uh, problems that AI can present. Uh, many of you have heard or have uh, read about or know that uh, AI systems, including those specifically designed to eliminate human bias in a decision-making and the criminal justice system and hiring, AI can actually end up replicating a human uh, biases. And there've been many, many uh, stories like this one where uh, AI systems actually ended up replicating and sometimes even uh, magnifying the, the human biases that uh, exist throughout uh, the full range really of uh, human, human activity. Uh, this is a particularly uh, disturbing example from um, an early stage uh, 2015, uh, Google just launched its uh, photo um, labeling system and uh, an engineer, actually a guy named Jackie Alsine, um downloaded it, playing around with it, used it on his photographs and realized that um, his face and the faces of his uh, black friends were labeled as gorillas, um, which was hugely embarrassing to, to, to Google, obviously, uh, hugely offensive. Uh, error rates, uh, racially bias, ra racial bias uh, problems continue to emerge in um, in uh, in uh, AI systems. Speech recognition. Jim mentioned speech recognition in the medical uh, note-taking uh, context, and uh, this is a Stanford study from 2020 showing that the error rate on speech recognition for black speakers was uh, double the error rate uh, for white speakers. And there's direct examples in the uh, healthcare arena. Uh, many, uh, of course, healthcare organizations use the commercial alg algorithms to guide health decisions. Uh, one, one particular system helps identify which patients are uh, needing of more care, which patients are sicker and upon admission to a hospital need to have greater attention paid to them. This particular system ended up ranking uh, blacks less sick than they really were compared to whites and when whites ended up being rated as more sick and therefore deserving of more care than they actually were and digging deep down the researchers realized that this was because the system had used health care expenditure as a proxy for sickness and unfortunately in our in our system uh, blacks receive less health care and spend less on health care than whites do have less access to health care and um, so using dollars spent on healthcare as a proxy for sickness is actually a racial, uh, will end, end up skewing your examples uh, racially. Hopefully everybody is aware of this. Uh, hopefully people are, are sort of attuned to this. There's been a lot of reporting on it uh, and you need to pay attention to it. Um, very quickly, there's also some significant uh, quality control issues. These are women in uh, a town in India, uh, Bhubaneswar, India. And they are uh, looking at uh, the video taken from that little camera that goes through the colon 
during the colonoscopy and they've been trained, they're not doctors, uh, they were trained remotely by uh, someone who's not a practicing doctor um, and they are circling the little polyps or drawing little circles around what they think is a polyp, which is indicative of potential um, risk of um, colon cancer. And that will be the training set. That will be the training data then to train a system to actually look at uh, real uh, camera images from inside uh, colons in order to identify uh, potential colon cancer. At the very least, it raises questions around quality, quality control. And a lot of work is being done, particularly on the racial bias side. IBM has been uh, one of the leaders on this. A couple of years ago, they launched something called uh, AI Fairness 360, which is an auditing tool that allows you to test your AI a system for uh, bias. So relatively high awareness, I, I hope, uh, I think in the uh, racial bias side. Today, we're focusing on a different set of problems. These are images from a study taken, uh, done in uh, partly by folks at Berkeley in uh, 2017, uh, that stop signs one and two are real stop signs in the real world. Um, and, you know, people put stickers on, people deface the stop sign, et cetera. But still, a human being looking at that would immediately see stop sign. And actually, the shape and color of the stop sign is pretty universal now. Somebody from even another country coming there, even if they didn't read English and didn't know the STOP spelled stop, um, would see that and immediately stop sign. The researchers trained a image recognition program to take images three, four, and five, which were created in a laboratory. And the researchers trained the AI system or fooled the AI system to believe that numbers three, four, and five were speed limit 45. Now, again, a human being looking at three, four, and five Immediately, you see a stop sign, despite those little perturbations, those little uh, changes in the image. One looks like it's faded, another looks like it has this weird uh, stickers on it. Human being, one through five, immediately sees it and says stop sign. The AI program here read three, four, and five as proceed speed limit 45. Now, this shows an important point. This is a laboratory example, it's not a real world example, although there was more recently a study with Tesla. Uh, split second phantom images could fool uh, the Tesla uh, autopilot uh, folks showed. But what this stop sign example shows is one important thing about AI. People often say that AI, what is AI? AI is a machine that thinks like a human. In fact, AI does not think at all like a human because a human can tell the difference here immediately. Um, and people often say, or sometimes it's said that neural uh, networks, which is one form of a machine learning technology, that the neural networks mimic the, uh, or work like the neurons in the brain. And again, I think you have to appreciate that they actually don't work like the neurons in the brain in critical ways. And those ways uh, can sort of uh, mislead you in terms of uh, understanding the vulnerability of AI. Last year, the National Security uh, Commission on Artificial Intelligence uh, released its uh, final report uh, talking about many, many issues in terms of artificial intelligence and the national security implications of artificial intelligence. Obviously, just like every other sector, the uh, national defense military is incorporating AI at a high rate of speed into many, many uh, different uh, military uh, applications. But the commission pointed out that the threat is not hypothetical. The Berkeley study was a lab type study. There's been a lot of lab studies uh, identifying the vulnerabilities in AI, but the threat is not hypothetical. Another uh, White House uh, National Science um, and Technology Council uh, working group uh, issued a, a report in 2020 uh, alerting uh, that AI systems can be manipulated in a variety of ways, including in a safety critical and uh, critical, uh, critical contexts. Um, 
And there is now a huge and growing, literally growing daily literature on adversarial, what's now called adversarial machine learning. Um, used in adversarial, used in this context of what happens when a um, goal-oriented attacker actually tries to attack and manipulate the system. The bias examples, of course, were all unintentional. Um, nobody intended to, to design a, a racially biased uh, AI, uh, and you have to understand how racial bias can creep in unintentionally. Adversarial uh, AI or adversarial machine learning is uh, refers to the case where you have a intentional adversary. And I checked this database, uh, Nicholas Carlini, who's one of the researchers in this field, maintains a, a database of all of the articles that are posted. And um, just last Thursday, there were uh, three. Uh, the day before the 16th, it doesn't even have the whole list. There were 10 or more uh, articles in a single day uh, published on adversarial machine learning and the defenses to it. So a hugely growing uh, field, at least in the academic context. A lot of work being done on this, which is very good. I've never seen a field that sort of moved so quickly uh, from sort of the hype, and there is obviously a lot of hype with AI, you have to be aware of that, uh, move from the hype to the uh, sort of recognition of a risk and a deep, deep study of uh, risk. Last year, uh, Andy Grotto and I, uh, my colleague at Stanford, published a paper. Um, we can uh, put the, the link in the, in the materials or make, otherwise make it available to people. Obviously, it's, it's online, in which we looked at this from a legal and policy perspective. Uh, but again, we tried to understand with a policymaker or sort of system management kind of perspective, uh, what is going on here? And we found that there are at least five kinds of vulnerabilities that are we can see in AI-based systems. And, and I say AI slash ML because AI is really a set of technologies and a lot of things may be referred to as AI. Um, here we're specifically talking about the, some of the more powerful and, uh, developments in AI where a lot of the current work is being done, which is on machine, uh, machine learning. And these are vulnerabilities by and large that are specific to machine learning. Uh, one is evasion uh, perturbation and the uh, Berkeley study with the stop signs is an example of this. There are now lots of examples. Um, this is a proof of a adversarial black box attack. That is, the attackers um, did not have the training data and the attackers did not have the algorithm. They did not have the AI uh, model uh, or model object. They did not have the, the AI itself. They had access to it, but they didn't have the guts of it. And yet they were able to uh, develop ways to trick it with speech commands, uh, things that were imperceptible to the human, uh, but that the machine misinterpreted um, as, some, as being something else. And you could think of real world examples of where um, somebody uh, sends a sound that says, you know, Alexa, open the front door. Um, and it's imperceptible to a human. Uh, similarly, black box adversarial attacks, lots of them have been demonstrated on facial recognition where um, the uh, AI will misidentify, uh, intentionally misidentify uh, the, the, um, the image. Um, there are Others, uh, data poisoning, the name I think is self-explanatory, but uh, certain types of AI, uh, certain types of machine learning are dependent upon training data. Uh, those ladies in India drawing the little circle around what they thought was a polyp and identifying it as this is what a polyp looks like. They were creating the training data, uh, the sort of ground truth, the sort of human adjudged uh, right or wrong, uh, yes or no, cancer, no cancer, you know, polyp, no polyp, 
uh, they were creating a, a, a set of 10,000, 20,000, uh, 30,000 images that would then be the training data. Well, if you can poison the training data, then obviously you've corrupted the model. Um, it may just pr produce um, uh, inaccurate, unreliable results, or worse, you may um, uh, do so uh, in a targeted poisoning attack uh, to uh, train the, the model to misclassify specific examples uh, to cause specific actions to be taken or omitted. A team of researchers at Microsoft um, have said that the uh, greatest security threat in machine learning today is data poisoning because of the lack of standard detections and mitigations in this space combined with the dependence on untrusted, uncurated public data sets. There are a number of public uh, data sets that are used for training purposes. There's one for street sign images, there's one for photographs, generally uh, ImageNet. Um, and if these were ever poisoned, they would then destroy the effectiveness of every model based upon that training data after the, after the, after the poisoning had occurred. Um, model stealing is interesting in this attack, um, also known as model extraction, an adversary is able to recreate the underlying model by uh, querying it. And then once the model is uh, recreated, it can be used to craft adversarial examples that can deceive the, the target model. And also it can mean loss of intellectual property if someone has put a huge amount of effort into developing a model, um, it can nevertheless be stolen and replicated. Model inversion uh, attacks the training data or at least uh, works to reconstruct the training data using information that is remembered. Again, we have to be careful applying sort of human concepts to, to neural networks, but the, the neural network retains enough information in it as it evolves uh, that it's possible to extract the sensitive attributes that are attached with a given label um, and basically um, uh, in a way create images that then would, uh, new images that would, you know what the outcome would be. Membership inference is another study uh, that has a particular relevance possibly in the healthcare context, um, particularly with the cloud-based or low with other uh, AI uh, uh, tools, AI services, where you can develop a model uh, using uh, resources available in the cloud. The training data may be sensitive. It may be healthcare data. Um, uh, Reza Shakri and others have demonstrated the possibility of a membership inference attack. Again, no access to the training data and no access to the model itself that is no knowledge of what how the model works or what the model is but the ability to nevertheless uh, determine whether a particular item was in the training data set and if the training data set is one that you know is all cancer patients theoretically this is a pretty hypothetical one but i think the healthcare needs to be aware of this um, the possibility of re-identifying records or concluding, inferring that records, uh, particular records were in the training data set, despite the fact that you treated the training data as uh, confidential. Uh, after the model was trained, you had pulled back uh, the training data. The training data never, never was um, out there in the wild. You can um, infer membership. Now, there's a lot of work going on uh, to develop uh, more robust AI. Again, uh, IPM is, is a leader on this, um, and we'll hear more, hear more about that in a, in a moment. But to some extent, the vulnerabilities in uh, particularly machine learning based systems are inherent in the technology itself. And there's not a fix in the way that there is a fix to insecure software or you know, um, buffer overload um, that uh, 
to some extent, in some critical ways, these vulnerabilities are inherent in uh, machine learning. Uh, DARPA has funded uh, a project on uh, guaranteeing, um, guaranteeing uh, AI robustness against uh, deception. Uh, my, IBM is part of the uh, consortium working on that. And there's a lot of work going on there. Um, products are being developed. Um, Google, uh, which has developed the TensorFlow uh, suite of uh, AI development tools has uh, included a uh, privacy component to that and uh, it, it put forth uh, some tools that can help protect uh, training data against some of these uh, attacks. So a lot of work going on there, but I think now and for the foreseeable future, our emphasis has to include parallel to these efforts to, to, to understand AI better and to understand and develop machine learning techniques that may be less susceptible to some of these attacks. Um, parallel to that, all developers and users of AI need to um, apply a risk management framework. Now, the good news is, if you have a halfway decent cybersecurity program already, you are already doing or should be doing risk management. At some level, AI is software. Um, AI-based systems are software systems and AI is part of larger um, configurations of uh, software products. And when Andy and I wrote our paper, one of our critical findings was that we need to recognize the risk management of AI vulnerabilities as a part of and as woven into the underlying risk management mentality and risk management processes and methodologies that should uh, be guiding any cybersecurity program more broadly. Um, NIST is doing work on this. They've developed or at least uh, drafted a AI risk management framework. Uh, for those of you who want a deeper dive or want to get involved in this, there actually is uh, a workshop uh, later this week or I guess next week. Um, uh, the second uh, workshop that NIST is holding on this AI risk management framework. Uh, my colleague, Andy Grotto fi filed uh, comments in this process. It's an open document available for comment. And the point Andy made was, let's not hive off AI risk management from cybersecurity risk management generally, that really we need to incorporate AI um, into the, the, the basic risk management uh, programs and processes and methods, uh, rather than always trying to reinvent the wheel for AI. There are some ways in which AI is unique and we need to develop unique policies and approaches for it, but the starting assumption should be that AI risk management is part of the broader cybersecurity uh, risk management of any, of any enterprise. So our, our, our basic conclusion in this uh, report was integrate AI into cybersecurity practices, starting with vulnerability discovery and management, and then integrate security concerns into AI governance. So to the extent that you are developing either as a corporation, as a developer of AI, as a government, or as a user of AI, to the extent that you have an AI governance uh, program or system or principles, security has to be part of that. The bias has to be part of it. Uh, the uh, unintentional failings has to be part of that. Um, the privacy piece has to be part of that, but so does the cybersecurity piece. And what is vulnerability discovery and management? So all software has flaws, uh, all software-based computer programs have uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, 
we're constantly trying to eliminate those vulnerabilities, but the recognition is we'll never get to, to zero, whether we're talking cybersecurity generally or AI. Um, and therefore, you have to discover your vulnerabilities and manage them. And you can either discover them through internal processes of regular review and internal red teaming and all of the internal, uh, you know, on the sort of traditional cybersecurity side, penetration testing and the scannings and the other activities that you do. And then also likewise on the AI side, internal uh, discovery of vulnerabilities and being open to external researchers uh, notifying you either as the developer or as the user of an AI-based system, uh, being able to receive external reports of vulnerabilities and then to figure out what to do about them. Just last week, uh, folks at uh, Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology, building in a way on the work that Andy and I did and taking it to the next level, this next report, uh, went deeper into the question of vulnerability disclosure and management for uh, machine learning systems. And they identified some ways in which um, vulnerability disclosure is going to be, and management is going to be different for uh, AI-based, particularly ML systems. Number one, as I said, patching may be more difficult for machine learning vulnerabilities. For traditional software vulnerabilities, you discover the vulnerability um, and a patch is developed, uh, the patch is published, uh, hopefully people will install it. Of course, we know there's difficulty in terms of patch management, but a lot of cyber, uh, traditional cybersecurity is based upon patch uh, development and management. Patching remediation, that is the elimination of the vulnerability is only one part of vulnerability management. The other half of vulnerability management is mitigation. That is finding a way to live with the vulnerability and to mitigate the impact of the vulnerability up to and including the decision not to use uh, the system at all, which um, for a uh, hardware-based system, which may be harder to patch or for um, certain kinds of software, that may be the decision. It may be more often the decision in the AI context. If a risk benefit uh, sort of analysis uh, says that the risk here is so high, the vulnerability is so great, the application is so critical that we're just not gonna be able to use AI until we come up with uh, either a remediation strategy or a, a better mitigation strategy. Um, also, uh, the vulnerability disclosure and management in the traditional software world, the, the, the sort of first line of defense is the product developer itself, which after all is able to develop uh, the patch. In the AI context, a lot more of the responsibility devolves onto the um, the user uh, to be aware uh, and to then do that sort of cost benefit analysis and to look at mitigation themselves because the answer is less often going to come from the product developer. The uh, mitigation strategies are more often gonna have to be developed by the user, which for a large healthcare organization is one thing for a smaller one, it becomes harder and harder the smaller you get. Um, and I think we still haven't figured out how the responsibility is gonna be allocated uh, among the different players, in a, particularly in the healthcare system, but in other contexts as well. There are other initiatives underway. Um, software supply chain at SBAUM are related. SBAUM is the Software Bill of Materials, which is an idea that has uh, gained uh, attention now. What's in your software? What, what you know, we discovered with the, um, the recent open source um, product that was uh, had a vulnerability, uh, the, the log4j uh, vulnerability uh, just shows that do people even know what is in uh, the products they are using? A similar concept applies to AI. 
uh, what data set, for example, was used uh, for this. Uh, other responses, protection of training data, as I said, uh, red teaming. I think everybody, you have to red team your own systems. Uh, just do not assume that people in the, everybody in the world is a nice person. Um, I mean, we, the thing we should have learned over the last 20 years with uh, technology is um, some pretty evil or sick people are going to spend a, a lot of time and have the capability, have the skills to think of ways to do bad things uh, with your technology. And you're going to have to think like them and um, probe your own systems and, and ask what's going to go wrong. Because don't assume that everybody is as high-minded as you are. So bottom line, understand the threat, ask the questions of your vendors, um, think the sort of risk management, I guess I could add here risk management uh, as a concluding thought. Uh, adopt, implement, um, practice the risk management mentality. Jim, hope that's helpful. Hope that's helpful to the audience. Uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, B. Puser. I think that was excellent. Thank you very much for laying that groundwork, Jim, and explaining kind of the basis for our specific concerns around technical threats and vulnerability management and AI. And with that being said, I'm thrilled as um, the executive director for Linux Foundation Public Health to be able to use that as an opportunity for collaboration with other parts of the Linux Foundation as well. As I'm sure many people understand, the development process for open source software projects is multi-stakeholder, collaborative, and in this context, most importantly, transparent. And with that, <clears throat> I'm very happy to have the opportunity to see an alignment between LF Public Health and uh, one of our sister projects, uh, LF AI and Data, led by my colleague, Ibrahim Haddad, and talk a bit about what we've done for open uh, source transparency and, uh, and work in developing AI. Uh, Ibrahim, I would uh, love to give you the opportunity to speak for a few seconds, and then we'll turn it over to Beat to talk about some of your specific developments. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. And by the way, um, the text uh, window was in the background. I just saw your message. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Ibrahim Haddad. I'm the executive director of the LF AI and Data Foundation. <clears throat> we are similar to LF Public Health. We are an umbrella foundation within the LF, within the Lynx Foundation. And we focus on advancing and accelerating innovation and the development of key open source uh, technology projects. Uh, and with that in mind, we host today uh, 36 technical projects. Uh, actually, one of them, uh, or actually more than one of them, will be presented later on uh, by BEAT uh, that are focused on the trusted AI uh, topic. So we host 36 technical projects. We have uh, five different uh, technical committees that are active, uh, including Trusted AI Committee. And everyone, of course, is invited to join. It's, um, you don't have to be a member of the foundation to, to, to join the, the effort of the committee. Um, and we support a little over 50 member companies in their various open source AI and data projects. Uh, so today, in relation to LF Public Health, uh, there's uh, Beat uh, Brusser from IBM, who is going to do uh, a presentation on the topic of trusted and responsible AI and the various projects. And we actually host three different projects in that space in LFA and data uh, focused on um, adversarial, focused on uh, fairness and um, 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 other related ethical validation of the various model and data set that are being used uh, out there. Um, so this is um, kind of a, a very kind of brief segue into Beat's presentation. Um, if you would like to learn more, you can visit our website. We are at lfaidata.foundation. Um, and of course, you can email me directly. My email is my first name, Ibrahim at tenixfoundation.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beat. And as Ibrahim uh, alluded, he's going to present some of the specific projects we're doing in this area uh, that support uh, fairness and transparency in AI processes. Over to you, sir. Beat, I think you're still on mute, my friend.
Okay, yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we sure can, thank you. Okay, great. And can you also see my shared screen? Uh, we can share, yep, we can see your screen, we're good to go. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the many uh, uh, talks before me. They were really an amazing introduction to the short presentations that I'm going to uh, present and have the opportunity to share uh, today. Uh, so my main focus is today on the Reserial Robustness Toolbox, or short art, uh, because I'm, I'm the maintainer of art, uh, which is the main reason why I'm here today, but I'm also a research staff member at IBM Research, and IBM has created the three uh, trustworthy AI uh, open source projects of Adversarial Robustness Toolbox, AI Fairness 360 and AI Explainability 360, and has uh, donated them uh, to the Linux Foundation for AI Data. And since then, they have uh, uh, flourished quite well at, at uh, being hosted by the Linux Foundation for AI. And today, uh, I uh, would like to give you a deep look into what, what ART provides to the trustworthy AI space. And uh, after having uh, listened to Jim's uh, presentation before, I think this is really an, an excellent place to present the actual tools for the uh, people that want to investigate these threats and also uh, secure their AI and ML applications. This is really one of the main uh, open source tools that you have available right now to, to do exactly uh, the investigations for the threats that we must just describe. <clears throat> so with that, let's just jump in into the short presentation. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, let me quickly start with uh, something that the LFAI and Data Working Group has uh, uh, created last year, that's the REPEATS framework, that really uh, collects uh, eight uh, principles that LFAI thinks are necessary for trusted AI. <clears throat> and that includes reproducibility, robustness, equitability, privacy, uh, explainability, accountability, transparency, and security. <clears throat> uh, these principles are of equal importance and there's no weighting or preference among them and uh, no principle is of higher priority than another one. And the principles are very much related among each other, so there are very strong relations and maybe also overlaps, but one that we are very convinced from the adversarial robustness side is that if you have a vulnerability on the robustness uh, dimension, then most likely all the other dimensions can also not be guaranteed as much as they might be advertised for a, uh, for a system. Because if you are able to uh, affect the robustness of a system with adversarial perturbations, then you can affect the privacy uh, uh, protection of a system, you can affect the explainability that the system provides, and all the other dimensions in, in, in various uh, 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 magnitudes. <clears throat> so that's why we would like to start that the adversarial robustness is really at the foundation of, of any AI ML system to guarantee all the other dimensions. And this is a, a nice image that we usually use to visualize the adversarial threats, so especially the uh, adversarial robustness toolbox is focusing on, but it's also a nice visualization of the threats that Tim has introduced in his talk. And it's really how uh, evasion, poisoning, extraction, and inference threat relate to the to the uh, training uh, pipeline of machine learning AI uh, system. How you can see is that here we have a malicious attacker wearing a black hat uh, can create evasion uh, or, or a staged an evasion attack by creating adversarial perturbations to the input of the machine learning model, trying to influence the output. Uh, poisoning is targeting the training data with aiming to have a later uh, uh, control at deployment time over the model's behavior. Uh, extraction is really looking at the output of the model, com combining it with input pairs and then try to extract uh, from anything from a, a good copy of the model to the e exact copy of the weights and architecture of that model. And inference, that's the most recent threat that we are covering with the adversarial robustness toolbox. That's really, uh, by having only access to the trained uh, deployed machine learning model, trying to learn something about the training data. Uh, 
with that, uh, let's uh, also mention, uh, as we have heard before, these are really real world uh, threats, and they have been documented many real world adversarial exploits, and this is really just a very small selection. There are uh, now nice and continuously growing databases in the internet that uh, continuously collect the uh, real world exploits. Uh, what I would like to quickly mention is a few ones that we have seen and found very interesting is, for example, evasion of classification of antivirus products. That's one uh, that has been uh, a threat that has existed even before maybe the adversarial machine learning uh, field has started to exist with its own name. Uh, people have tried to evade the classification as antiviruses uh, as soon as antivirus products appear, uh, or real world adversarial patches for evasion on on self-driving cars. That's a very prominent topic as these uh, autonomous cars become more and more abundant. Uh, more and more people will try to interfere with them uh, on any scale from just trying to cause chaos towards really targeted attacks against specific cars. Uh, another one that we found very interesting is uh, extraction of classification models followed by an evasion attack against an email protection system that even got the official uh, vulnerability notes. The, the, one of the reasons why we find this one very interesting is that it's really a combination of two different threats, the extraction in the first stage of the attack and then followed by uh, using the extracted model to stage an evasion attack. And that way, uh, really, uh, uh, email protection uh, products have been uh, bypassed that way, which is often then the first stage of uh, staging phishing attacks, for example, which is then the entry point into uh, protected networks <clears throat> and, and so on. Uh, this really shows that uh, adversarial machine learning can be at really at the very, very uh, beginning of also more classical uh, threats in, in cybersecurity. And then well, something that's very important, uh, especially because of severe uh, uh, penalties and fines uh, by recent laws is leakage of sensitive private information. So if, if an attack can reveal uh, that a person has been part of a certain health data set, the, that membership information could uh, release information about the health condition of that person. And that's something that's uh, 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 very much not allowed to happen. <clears throat> Especially, as I mentioned before, what ART is really trying is to have a, a one framework where you easily can investigate other com combinations of these threats. So you really want to bring evasion, poisoning, extraction, and fields very close together so that you also can invest, uh, investigate and research to combine combined threats of these uh, attacks. <clears throat> uh, a quick overview of the adversarial robustness toolbox. Uh, so in general, we would like to say is that ART is a Python library for machine learning security. Uh, it is open source, available on github.com in the trusted AI working uh, workspace. <clears throat> and its main goal is really to provide tools for developers and researchers. So we are very much on the right hand side of, of, uh, of, of, of everything. <clears throat> and the goal is to make sure that the developers and researchers can uh, evaluate, defend, certify, and verify their machine learning models and applications with state-of-the-art attack algorithms and implementations of these algorithms. And for that, ART is not limiting itself to any specific task in machine learning. It, it aims to support all possible tasks uh, uh, instead. It started in image classifications where uh, adversarial machine learning became very popular. But uh, as, uh, since we have joined uh, the Linux Foundation for AI and Data, we have extended R to include object detection, uh, generation and encoding in, in uh, generative adversarial networks, certification, uh, but also uh, speech recognition, object tracking have been added uh, most recently. <clears throat> We also were uh, very independent of frameworks, meaning we are supporting all popular machine learning frameworks. That includes TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, MXNet, but also non-deep learning uh, machine learning frameworks like Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, like CBM, etc. This shows that uh, adversarial machine learning is not just a deep learning problem, but a machine learning problem in general. And then we also try to support uh, all data types. So we started with images because of image classification, but we have then since then branched out to support uh, tabular data, audio data, video data, etc. And because we are an open source project, uh, feedback and uh, contributions are always very welcome, of course. 
Uh, I would quickly uh, like to highlight, uh, if you would like to get to know more, we have three main contact points in, in the open uh, where you can start uh, either discussing us with us technical uh, uh, topics, but also more uh, uh, general topics around adversarial machine learning and art. So I would like to quickly highlight our Slack workspace, uh, workspace where uh, we have around 300 to 400 members already, where we have uh, uh, ongoing discussions about the topics of adversarial machine learning and art. I would like to quickly highlight the Linux Foundation for AI and uh, Data's monthly meetings. So on the fourth Thursday at 7 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, uh, we are usually meeting uh, to discuss progress on the trustworthy AI projects, but also have uh, often invited industry talks uh, uh, from uh, uh, colleagues in the industry that uh, report about how they either apply to trustworthy AI open source projects, but also uh, uh, new pro problems uh, that they are uh, or, or projects that they are working on uh, to uh, also get feedback on on their uh, approaches. And then, of course, GitHub, where, where where we are hosting the open source project, but uh, where we also have a discussion step, uh, where we often have more technical uh, discussions about how to use the tools and. Uh, uh, discuss about the improvements of the tools, etc. And of course, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. We are very, uh, um, all these uh, forums are very friendly and uh, are very happy to see you uh, uh, starting to join into discussions there. Uh, I would like to, towards the end, uh, uh, quickly show uh, something, uh, the, uh, kind of a vision that we are also trying to develop with artists, uh, this notion of red teams versus uh, blue teams in machine learning. And uh, art is very much uh, aligned with the AI red team versus AI blue team approach. Uh, you, you remember at the beginning, I've shown you the malicious attacker wearing a black hat attacking the machine learning pipeline, the tools of art we envision to be used by uh, evaluators wearing white hats. So people that want to attack, use attack tools to evaluate the robustness and security of machine learning pipelines. Uh, so we usually draw it as uh, poisoning evaluation tools, inference evaluation tools, extraction evaluation tools, evaluation, evaluation tools. But of course, these uh, evaluations use the actual attack tools uh, provided in art. And next to that, we also have a growing selection of blue team tools. So that and they, they are often uh, they are more challenging, and they are not as uh, always as successful as the red team tools. But uh, th that's where we have a very very uh, large interest in and in having very strong blue team uh, tools to defend against the threats. So we have, uh, for example, poison detection tools, uh, adversarial training algorithms that increases the adversarial robustness of of uh, the neural networks or but, uh, also a growing number of certification approaches that uh, have a really a theoretical guarantee of a certain robustness uh, that the model provides in, for certain applications. This uh, is just a quick uh, overview of the tools that ART provides. And it, I don't expect you to read the whole list. It is more kind of to show you that there's really a very large number of attacks that have different approaches of generating adversarial perturbations in each of the four different threads. And the number of attacks is really rapidly growing. So we are not comprehensive at all. I think we are the most comprehensive library that is uh, that exists. But um, as you have seen in James' talk before, the number of publications in the field is growing very fast. And so we, we are trying to keep up with the most important and the most uh, severe uh, 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 attacks uh, first. And then we also see in green, that's kind of a growing number of uh, defense uh, or blue team approaches that are just promoting. Uh, at the end, I would also quickly like to highlight tools building on art, on art. Uh, working together with the Linux Foundation for uh, AI and Data has given us a lot of uh, um, visibility. So other projects start to build on top of art. So for example, Armory is an adversarial robustness evaluation testbed that uh, uses art to run adversarial robustness evaluations, but then uh, includes that in Docker containers uh, to easily allow scaling uh, such robustness evaluations. There's Microsoft's Counterfeit, which is a command line tool to simplify running evaluations with art in terminals. Uh, so once you have created your setup, it's very easy to do parameter studies 
against uh, for you for the evaluations uh, of interest and then there's also ai privacy toolkit from ibm which is uh, providing tools for privacy and compliance evaluations of ai models and the goal is there to uh, uh, support end-to-end -end privacy evaluations and mitigations of privacy risks and that's also open source in the ipm workspace um, with that i just will uh, quickly an uh, overview uh, you see that the uh, six main uh, modules that are provides these are attacks, defenses, estimators, evaluations, metrics, and pre-processing. There are many uh, sub-modules there, uh, but you can find more information in the documentations and on the art GitHub repository. With that, I would like to thank you very much for the attention and also for the opportunity to provide in this great uh, session today. Thank you very much. Pete, that was an excellent overview. Thank you to you and to Ibrahim to highlight both the specific ART toolbox and the projects we're doing there, as well as AF, uh, LFAI overall. I don't happen to see any uh, other questions uh, in our uh, question session, our QA and Q A session. So I think I'm going to wrap up for today. I again want to thank uh, Jim Dempsey, Ibrahim, and Beat for their presentations. Uh, I hope you found this useful. The recording will be available via our respective websites. And of course, you can go to linuxinformation.org, uh, lfph.io, and LFAI for finding additional information. And of course, would welcome you as members. I hope that uh, you have a great rest of your Monday and a great rest of your week and look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you again, everybody, and have a great day.